So in this video, I'll be interviewing Emmy Thomas, who is a diagnosed sociopath. She's also the author of Confessions of a Sociopath, A Life Spent Hiding in Plain Sight. It's a good book. I've read it twice. I've also watched many of her videos on YouTube. Um, I just want to say a couple things before this interview starts. If you are dealing with someone who is in, who is being abusive towards you in any way, shape, or form, you need to do what you need to do to get yourself out of that situation ASAP. Don't pay attention too much on what diagnosis this person has. If they're if they're this, if they're that, you know, uh, what acronym they have attached to them. Uh, abuse is still abuse, so you need to do what you need to do to get yourself out of the situation ASAP. Please, don't watch these videos looking for any type of help or or ways to get back at someone else. These, this isn't that type of video. I'm literally just trying to figure out the inner workings of someone's mind that works differently than mine does. That's literally the point of all these videos that I do. Uh, another thing I want to say is if you are someone who... The description that she gives of a sociopath... I didn't go down the DSM-5 list of ASPD, which is a personality disorder, which is what I usually do for these interviews. I didn't go down it. I just had so many questions I wanted to ask. I just didn't have time. Um, I will do a separate video on the symptom criteria for ASPD, which is antisocial personality disorder, which is the actual diagnosis of what people refer to as a sociopath. Um, if, the, if, if the shoe fits a little too well, I would suggest seeking counsel, seeking professional help and counseling ASAP. Um, nothing wrong with it. You know, nothing's wrong with going to therapy. Nothing's wrong with figuring out who you are and why you are the way you are, and how you function, how you work. So, with that being said, uh, everyone, please enjoy this video. Uh, I understand it's a very sensitive topic for lots of people, but this is what I do. So, enjoy. Okay. What's up, everybody? This is Wavy Thoughts and Talks. My name is David, but everyone calls me Wavy. I do a series on my YouTube channel where I interview people with different mental health conditions. The point of these is to destigmatize disorders and humanize people afflicted with them. The best way to watch these, especially probably this interview, is from an unbiased, non-judgmental non non -judgmental point of view. What I'm trying to do is empathize with someone and put myself in their shoes, and I hope you do the same too. So with that being said, please introduce yourself and tell people what you got going on. My name is, well, I guess my pen name is Emmy Thomas, and I wrote the book Confessions of a Sociopath, A Life Spent Hiding in Plain Sight. And when, like, just before I turned 30, I got diagnosed uh, with psychopathy, I guess. I don't even know. Antisocial personality disorder. I don't think it was that because he used the PCLR. And so mm -hmm. I guess that that equals psychopathy. And, um, yes, I went to therapy, like, seven years ago now. I went to therapy for, like, four or five years. And I, there are, like, certain things that I've been able to resolve. So I probably am not currently diagnosable anymore with maybe any personality disorder or like right on the cusp mm -hmm. a wobbler <laughs> yeah. and uh but there are other things that i still have you know like i i still don't have like the effective empathy you know where your brain just automatically kind of responds with you know you feel i guess the way that other people feel mm -hmm. yeah uh anyone watching if you're interested on how uh people who have ASPD or sociopathy, how they function, definitely go look up her book. Uh, I'm, I've, I'm a fan of it. I've read it twice. Um, it's, a, it's a great book if you want to understand the inner workings of someone who has sociopathy. I, I, really, I really enjoyed it because uh, it's definitely to hear, because it's, it's, it's like your own inner, it's like, you know, people want to understand how People, when people want to, want to understand how someone with sociopathy, how their brain functions, how they work, you're just literally hearing the inner dialogue of someone. Well, I mean, I listened to it on Audible, so I got to hear whoever the voice actor was. But you, you hear the inner dialogue of someone who has sociopathy. So it's, it's a very fascinating book. I definitely enjoyed it. She also has a YouTube channel under Emmy Thomas. You can go look it up. I'll have it tagged underneath in the description. Um, so to pay homage to your channel, what is it like to be you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the question I always ask people. You know, it's funny too because a personality disorder, they like the the part of like what's disordered about you is your personality, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have kind of like 
not a real clear conception of who you are, or there's something about kind of like your conception of who you are is distorted or messed up, or it's like uh, not fully formed. It's not fully developed. There was some disruption, you know, there when you developed uh, kind of your personality because, and I'll, I'll just pause and then come back to your question because you you don't have a sense of your identity until about you start getting one about like two years old before then you just kind of think everybody's kind of the same. You think your your mom's you, and you think you're your mom, basically. So that's the primary kind of connection that you have. And then around two years old, right about the time that you start recognizing yourself in the mirror is when you start thinking, okay, I'm a, I'm a separate person, right? And then you start kind of building upon that realization, well, what type of person am I, right? And so that's how most people develop a sense of self, de develop a sense of their own personality or identity. And for people with personality disorders, it just got disrupted somehow. It just mm -hmm. didn't go through the entire development process. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a funny thing to ask people with a personality disorder because it's a very difficult question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that, it gets at the heart of like the disorder, which is you're not really sure, you know? And I think that's a good way to kind of put it is that for me, you know, as a psychopath, I, I mostly think that uh, the way that my specific personality disorder manifests itself is just in a very weak sense of self. And so, you know, I may know certain facts about myself, like I may know that I'm female, that, you know, like I'm five foot three or four, depending on who's doing the measuring or with the shoes that I, you know, have size eight feet, you know, <laughs> that I, I have like, you know, these parents, I was born in this city, like I know my social security number, but I feel like as much connection to like all these aspects of my personality, the same way that I feel connection, I guess, to my social security number, which it just seems kind of random. Like, I know that that's true. I know that that's me, but I don't feel that that's me. Okay. Okay. So, um, if you could, how would you describe sociopathy? I know that's a that, that's a huge it's a, it's a huge umbrella of, of things and it encompasses a lot of things. But for your own experience, how would you describe it? So there are like I like twelve kind of to eighteen characteristics about sociopaths, depending on again who you're asking. Like there's not a lot of. Uh, I guess, consistency <laughs> yeah. in this disorder. There's more consistency like in other disorders, I guess, about what exactly it is. There's like a lot of disagreement is a good way to put it, uh, where people kind of think it's X a little bit more or Y. But there, th some of the characteristics of a sociopath include that they, they can be charming, they, like a superficial charm. They can be like glib. They, they don't have like a strong sense of their own feelings and consequently they don't have, they don't experience guilt. So they don't have like uh, the same sort of feeling about morality that most people tend to have. They don't uh, make emotional decisions as much. They, you know, because their emotions aren't really that important to them. They, they kind of don't care what other people think about them. And so they often end up uh, kind of doing things that are against the status quo. I think that's where the antisocial comes from the antisocial yeah. personality disorder. So they're, they're very disinhibited, you know, like maybe if you, you drink on the weekends or something to kind of disinhibit some of these, you know, thoughts and feelings like, oh, I can't do that. You know, what would people think of me? Or I'd feel too guilty. The psychopath doesn't really experience that. They're just kind of disinhibited all the time. <clears throat> So some people think that it's correlated with violence. I don't think it's correlated with violence necessarily, but it's correlated for sure with disinhibition and kind of impulsivity. So to the extent that somebody's, you know, has like a violent impulse, then mm. there's not as much kind of like keeping them from acting upon that impulse. Uh, I mean, they it's been associated with criminality, but I don't think that's necessarily true. You know, criminality itself is just something that, you know, each each nation state makes <laughs> as part of its criminal law, yeah. you know? So it's kind of a weird thing to like hinge it upon that you're, you know, like criminal, what's criminal in California is not criminal in other places. Like mm -hmm. pot, for instance, you know, is legal. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> in California. So it's, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but the, there's a disregard for the safety of oneself and others. I think this again, kind of comes from the weak sense of self, you know, that you, you, you don't really feel attached 
to yourself and so you don't really have like fears with regard to yourself your safety your physical safety uh or even your mental safety your psychological safety so the risk takers tend to take like a lot of risks uh, they don't feel effective empathy for whatever reason and maybe it's because they're not really connected to their own emotions that they're not really connected to the emotions of other people it, it might be like a brain defect it might just be something that never kind of develops inside their brain the mirror neurons don't seem to be like operating the same way they have a really low startle response so if you like shoot a gun right next to them uh, uh psychopaths and buddhist monks have this in common also yeah. the other thing they have in common it's really interesting that the, this is actually kind of correlated and i can send you the article about this is that they're both really good at reading people so especially reading people's weaknesses. So if you see somebody walking or talking, then you can kind of like naturally pick up on some of their fears, some of their worries, their concerns, their some of the weaknesses, yeah, vulnerabilities that you might be able to exploit. So it's funny, like uh, both psychopaths and Buddhist monks are good at <laughs> finding people's vulnerabilities. Like uh, it just kind of an interesting, I think it's because of the detachment, you know, like what do they have in common they're both kind of like the Buddhist monks are trying to get detached from the sense of self and the psychopaths are just naturally that way or that's how they've developed, you know, s since they were like a little baby is to just kind of be detached from that sense of self. Uh, so they, th since they have that low startle response, they tend to have like some physical markers, like really low blood pressure and really low heartbeat. So like my girlfriend, who's also a psychopath, her Apple watch will wake her up at night, you know, several times being like, are you still alive? Your heart has like dipped way too low yes. and we don't want you to die. So it'd be like, wake up, your heart rate's too low. All right. That was actually one of my questions. And since you brought it up, I'm just going to ask it now. What is it like? Uh, I know, I know that you have a girlfriend who also has the same diagnosis. Um, what is that? What's the dynamics of that relationship like? Because it could either be like, oh, you guys are too similar, so it won't work out. Or you guys are so similar that it does work out. How, how, yeah. What is that like? So I kind of think of psychopathy. I think that there are kind of like stages, like real loose stages, you know, and not everybody kind of goes through them to the same degree. But I think that it kind of helps to conceptualize a little bit. And there are two main stages in adulthood that I think are like really important to kind of highlight. One of them is called, I call it the playground stage. Actually, another psych psychopath called it this. Playground stage is like they're at their peak. Psychopathic behaviors is probably a good way to put it. And it usually is happening like in their early 20s, kind of the 20s, like throughout the 20s, maybe until the late 20s or into the early 30s. And, and during that time period, they're super carefree. You know, like really literally nothing can bother them. They're like Teflon, like everything seems to kind of just run off them. You know, they, they burn through relationships and jobs and educational, professional opportunities. And they're just they just don't care. You know, what is it like? Uh, like. Well, I don't I don't know if you swear on this channel, do you? Probably not. <laughs> uh, not really, but uh, people have so you can. I I've done it by yeah. accident. So. I'll use I'll use the uh, the not swear word but like no f's were given you know <laughs> like, <laughs> that's yeah. that's they're truly the embodiment of that where it's just like they, they almost couldn't care you know about the things around them in fact yeah they, they can't care about the things around them so it's like a super carefree existence it's very hedonistic it's very kind of like what's happening today and like very, you know, they they don't like to be bored. That's the one thing that they really kind of fear maybe uh, is boredom because they feel it like so painfully, uh, <laughs> like like worse than being sick, like by a million or something. So mm -hmm. they're constantly chasing that next, uh, chasing the dragon, chasing that next you know, novel. Movie. Yeah, novel seeking. Yeah, to the nth, nth degree. So in the playground, that's that's kind of how they are. And they're really like uh, cold during that time period, like not connected to other people, like zero connected, not very self-reflective, not very self-aware, like kind of like a, you know, have you ever seen these movies where like a child becomes like an adult, but they're like a child's mind in an adult body? Yeah. There was that movie Big with Tom Hanks where that was true. That's a oh, little bit like what that. they are. I, I know yeah, they have like. Know. 
yeah like the selfish mind selfish kind of childish mind like when you're a child you're like oh when i when i'm older i'll just do this like every day eat ice cream every day or whatever and that's kind of who they are <laughs> just like, sounds like me <laughs> yeah 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 they'll, they'll like binge drink they'll do weird drugs or like weird you know like sex things or just kind of like have no inhibitions about anything they're just totally freewheeling is a, a is a good way to put it and like bad things do happen to them but it just doesn't seem to affect them and i think it's kind of gets at something that's like the the way that psychopaths attend to things with their attention is unique you know they're like able to hyper focus on certain things and compartmentalize other things like out of their mind really easily so that they're never like oh I, I can't stop thinking about x they're like really good about stop thinking about x <laughs> and then just move to start thinking about y the one thing that's a little bit difficult for them is let's say they're obsessed with y then it's hard for them to stop being obsessed with why. But it, they're really good about compartmentalizing and being like, okay, that failed relationship, I'll just never think about it again. So they're never sad about breakups <laughs> or things like that. It's like, like out that. of sight, out of mind. And really yes, it's it. it's completely that way. And because they're able to do that, then they they're, another characteristic of psychopaths is they don't learn from experience. So they'll keep making the same mistake multiple times. So when I met my girlfriend, she was at the tail end of the uh, of the playground stage. And when I first met her, I was like, OK, she's like, you know, party hard. So, OK, that's just where she is right now, you know, and there wasn't really that much of a connection. But then she went through like a lot is a good way to put it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So eight months later, she was in the next stage, which I would call the reckoning. And it pro it is what it sounds like, you know, it's just like all these things that you've kind of been putting off, you know, suddenly you realize, oh, I'm in debt and, you know, yeah. I've, I've porched these family relationships and now I can't even go back to the city because <laughs> people hate me so much or whatever. So she was just starting kind of the reckoning and she was just going to see a therapist. And uh, so... I don't think we could have gotten along too much if she was just like all in the playground stage is because honestly, she would say this, I'd come out to visit her and she'd be like, can you tell me what you're wearing so I can recognize you? Yeah. Can you imagine your girlfriend says that to you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because she just, it was out of sight, out of mind still kind of still going on with her a little bit. So she just wasn't that interested. She's not that interested in like me or my feelings and just didn't have like that much energy to invest. But she, as she kind of kept going through the reckoning, she, she became like more interested in those types of things. So I think that it kind of depends. I don't think it's like psychopaths are necessarily meant for each other, but now that we're both kind of like, I would say she's mostly through the reckoning. And then, so we're on the other side, whatever you call it or, or something I guess I'm okay. You're okay is what what I call yeah. it. <laughs> now I'm remembering. Once one, now that we're in, I'm okay. You're you're okay, and we're just kind of like chill about it. Then it is kind of nice to know that we we have like these words, like this language that we use with each other, like chicken people, like getting so frustrated with chicken people, like a chicken person thing to say was. I just had like this um, kind of podcast interview the other day where the the person was like kind of asked me like hey have you ever been in love and i thought probably not you know not the way that you experience it at least and then i said too that i was also like a professional musician and he was like how can you be a musician if you've never been in love and i think that's such a chicken person thing to say yeah <laughs> you, don't have to. you could be a really good uh musician at something and doesn't mean i mean i i get it that love love and music kind of ties together lots of times people make music about love you can make music Right. Hate. You can make music about a lot of things. So yeah, you can make music about birds, like yeah. uh, what whoever that composer was <laughs> wrote a bunch <laughs> of bird songs. Yeah. So it was just uh, I think a chicken person thing would be to kind of prioritize your emotions and your emotional feelings, kind of above, above all, even to like a like a. a this is going to be controversial, like a narcissistic degree. You know. So I see, especially. I feel this way because that's what I saw my dad do. You know, he'd have his feelings and be like, look, goosebumps. You know, I've probably heard him say that like a million times. And he's he's just so like into his feelings, like like in this very kind of masturbatory way that seems to disregard, like doesn't really leave space for anybody else's feelings. Okay, It's funny. I, yeah, I was talking to my sister-in-law 
And she was talking about how she's just bothered by polyamory. She thinks that it's like kind of bad or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, you know, start to kind of say something. And she she said, and there's space for me to have that feeling. <laughs> yeah. like, okay, sure. Yeah, there is space, I guess, for you to have. I mean, that's just how you feel, you know, like whatever. But I think uh, it's totally fine for people to have feelings and everybody has space to have their feelings. But have you ever known somebody who has like feelings that kind of like don't leave space for you to have feelings? It, it, have you ever had it, that? Their feelings, their emotional state trumps everyone else's in the room or even just if you're with them by themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So so we'll, my girlfriend and I will talk about things like that and be like, oh, we hate people like that. We don't hate people like that, but we hate. You know, like they they just seem to have like this weird moral superiority about it, too. Like, oh, I feel this way. And so therefore, you know, like, I don't know, like your your guys' feelings are like less important or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, no OK, room, there's no room for understanding, at least. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're not open minded they, because they, they feel it so strongly. Uh, so, yeah. So that's nice is that. Like, I couldn't be, I guess, with somebody who was like that, who had such strong feelings because, you know, I, I have so much trauma, I guess, from my dad kind of doing that. Like, you know, there's no room for me to have my own feelings because his feelings are so big and they're so kind of all encompassing that it's like everything about our family life revolves around his feelings, mm -hmm. you know, and that's that's kind of a hard thing to do when you're like a little child trying to develop your own sense of self and your own sense of individuality to be constantly dominated by the feelings of somebody else. So I'm really sensitive to it is probably a good way to put it as an adult. Uh, and so in that way, like she and I like get along really well because she, she has a hard time feeling her feelings. If anything, she's the opposite, you know, she goes to the opposite extreme where oh. she's not giving herself enough space to actually just feel those feelings. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes have to remind her like, do you think that it would be a good idea to just like, you know, sit down and cry a little bit about this and stuff? You know, that's how we talk. Yeah. <laughs> <Feelings>. <laughs> All right. So you brought up a good point. And this, this would be a part of me trying to humanize the disorder, at least because, you know, this sociopathy has that and narcissism has to be the two most stigmatized disorders out there. And I'm not saying, hey, everyone should go date someone who has ASPD or who is a sociopath. It's the best thing you could do. I'm not saying that either. But my, what I'm trying to do is at least people who are willing to look at this from my angle or from a more compassionate angle, it's important to understand what it was like for someone who has sociopathy, what it was like growing up. Because I'm what you you just you just mentioned it, how you went through trauma. And I, I read your book and I remember in your book you mentioned a time where your dad was uh, damn near breaking down the door and you were in he the bathroom. He did break down the door, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and you just kind of felt numb. Uh, what kind of experiences did you go, if you want to get into it, what kind of experiences did you go through growing up with, uh, with your parents or what trauma do you think you went through and what was your relationship like with them? <clears throat> so some of it, I think, you know, in fairness to them was just not their fault. So one of the things was that I just had as an infant, like very young, like two, two, three weeks old or something, I had a really bad case of colic, which is just, you know what colic is? No, I wouldn't know either. I still kind of don't know it. I think it's like a, uh, it's a yeast infection, but you get it in your mouth. And like, because oh, you remember. have to eat through... Yeah. I remember you said, talking about this in your book. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It was so terrible that they, my parents said that I would cry like 23 and a half hours a day and just constant crying. It would be so bad that my mom had a nervous breakdown over it. They would just put me in a room by myself to cry because like, what could you do? You know, like hold, hold me for the 23 and a half hours. Like you have to sleep, you have to eat. I had older brothers, you know, one of them was like still in diapers and I guess we were in cloth diapers and like my dad wouldn't buy my mom a dryer. So she had to like wash all these cloth diapers and like hang the cloth diapers up on the clothesline. And my brother had problems too. He had, um, he would like frequently have diarrhea because he has like gastrointestinal issues. It's funny how like when your parents get older, maybe you haven't experienced this yet. You're not quite as old as I am. <laughs> but like your parents start kind of like 
going through these like trips down memory lane where they're like, yeah, I did have a nervous breakdown about that. Or like, you know, I really should have known about your brother. Like we should have taken him to the hospital or to the doctor because that wasn't right. Like there, there was something wrong with him and he still has problems to this day. And so my mom feels like a lot of guilt, uh, especially with me and my brother about like the way that she was when we were little, which was very probably absent because she was having this nervous breakdown. So I think, I mean, that's, I don't blame her for that. Like people have nervous breakdowns and stuff. Probably my dad should have stepped in and helped, but I don't know. You know, it's just a different generation, a different time. They didn't maybe have access to psychological help or kind of like the information that we have now about it. <clears throat> You know, it kind of reminds me of this, like, I think we're often quick to judge things, but my, my girlfriend's reading a book about Timothy McVeigh. Do you remember him? The Unabomber? Yeah. And I, he got radicalized actually during a war. He was a military guy. He was going to be a Green Beret, I think. And he, uh, he got radicalized because the military was so like bum bum is a good way to put it like when they so they're in kuwait you know the iraqi military is just like you know untrained so he he shot these two people and then he kind of felt like you know why did i shoot those two people they're just probably like kids that have been like drafted forcibly drafted into the military yeah. and then as they're getting ready to leave kuwait they had all these extra supplies and stuff and his leaders were like, you know, you're going to be tempted to give this medicine and this food to these Iraqi families who desperately need it. But like, don't give it to them because, you know, that they're used to different types of food and this food will just like hurt them. And it was like such a weird lie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because but like they're just MREs, you know, they can eat like enchiladas, you know, just MRE enchiladas, just like anybody else can. But like I thought. But that lie was easier to tell during that time period, whenever it was the early 90s. Nowadays, like it's much more difficult to tell people lies like that, to try to dehumanize like the Iraqis and be like, because one of his people said, you, you just have to think of them as animals. Like this is yeah. the sort of stuff that kind of wouldn't fly anymore with everybody with a smartphone and it's just so easy to verify things. But like at the time, they just knew nothing, you know, and I when I was a baby, it was like the early 80s. Right. So like, who knows what she knew? Like they were using cloth diapers. You know? Yeah. <laughs> like it's just a, they, it's a different time. They just didn't have the same information. They had like maybe one book about raising babies and that was like it. And if you didn't see your problem in that book, then you were like screwed. You know, you didn't know what to do. And uh, yeah, that's just what happened. And so after kind of like months of that, I guess my guess is, that that just wasn't good for my brain development, my social <laughs> brain development to just be isolated in a room yeah. crying, you know, like basically all day. And then there were other things, too. Like, so my dad, you know, I've mentioned before, he just his emotions kind of so big, he like kind of, you know, takes up all the room. So I would say that he has narcissistic personality disorder. I don't judge him either, he, you know, even after all the bad things that he did to me, because he had like way more. I think they're called aces. The, the childhood traumas that you experience and there's like a certain number that you can have of aces. He has like basically every ace that there could be, you know, like sexual abuse, physical abuse, starvation, just like, you know, being separated from your, your mother, like an early age, like just all these crazy things that would like, you know, death, crazy deaths in the family, all these kind of traumatic experiences that you could have. And so it's like a it's kind of a wonder to me that he's as functional in society as he is, you know, mm. like good for him for being able yeah. to. What do, you, what do you expect when someone goes through all these different like there's po there's PTSD and there's CPTSD, which is like complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's like that's just multiple instances happening to you over time that affect the way your brain is developing and as you're growing. So, I mean, in my head, I, I, I'm just like, it's kind of like the cards you were dealt and like, what did you expect was going to happen? You know, unless that child was taken out of that situation somehow and the cycle was uh, uh, broken, you know, what do you expect is going to happen? You know? Yeah. And he wasn't taken out of that situation. And like, I don't know what's up with his parents. It's a little easier for me to judge them for some reason, because I don't know their background, like their backstory. Maybe they too had all these tra traumatic events. They never said anything about it, but they would have like eight people like sleeping in like a one bedroom. 
can you imagine it's just like bunk bed bunk bed bunk bed and then two you know two people sleeping in the middle it's like okay like do you guys think that <laughs> that maybe these children are not getting sufficient resources Mm -hmm. for for whatever is happening and he still has like all these you know obvious psychological scars uh that he carries with him like he's really he's like a hoarder and he's like food aggressive and just like all these things that he struggles with and he has a hard time with his temper and he's also had multiple concussions like really bad concussions and i know that he's not trying to like i know he doesn't want his grandchildren to be afraid of him you know, he really is trying, but he just never got like the help that he needed, unfortunately. And some of that's a little bit of that is probably his fault. But, you know, it, again, it's kind of hard to say he's just old, you know, like it was just a different time back then. But like <clears throat> he would as kind of a defense mechanism himself for some of this childhood trauma, he needed things to be like he needed to feel like he was in control of things all the time. So, you know, there were obviously like abusive things, physical abuse or other things that would happen. But I think almost more insidious and maybe contributing more to the development of the personality disorder that I have were kind of like the little things that he would do. So I, I had I remember this like a few years ago. It's just like a little story, but I would I shared a bedroom with my two sisters and I'm the oldest of, of that group. And so they were still playing with like Barbies and stuff. And by the time I got to be like 10 or 11, I was like, I'm done with Barbies and I don't like your toys everywhere. You know, like this place is a mess. Like keep your keep your toys away from my stuff. <clears throat> and so what I did is I put like some masking tape like around my bed and kind of just made like a little area and said, this is my area. You know, yeah. keep your toys out of my area. And then when he came in and saw it, he was so angry. He's like foaming at the mouth, like, this is not your room. These are not your toys. Everything's mine. And he starts ripping up the tape and like getting so angry about it. But it's just like any time that you try to do that, either physically or kind of emotionally, psychologically, just kind of like carve out some space for yourself and just be, yes, mm -hmm, a boundary, as yes, a personal boundary and say, this is me and mine and you can't come over it. That was always the thing that reliably triggered him. In fact, if you remember, the when he tore down the door is when I took this like phrase from my mom. She would say, I'm rolling up my window on you. Basically like a boundary. Like, I'm not going to listen to you right now. And to him, with his personality disorder, uh, the way that he would experience that is just like his existence was being totally disregarded. You know, that I was saying, you're not a person. I, I'm disregarding you you know, 10 out of 10 right now, like you're nothing to me. That's how it would feel to him, you know? So like a normal person asserting boundaries just feels like a total existential threat to him. And so he just like flies off the handle, which again, you know, it's not really his fault, but you can see how it contributed maybe to like me just being like, well, I'm just not going to assert myself then. Like I'm going to stop putting the tape up. I'm going to stop having personal boundaries. In fact, I'm going to stop having a personality at all. Kind of. I'm just going yeah. to, you know, detach from that part of me and uh, because that's safer, because when I when I'm connected to my identity and he attacks it like that, it hurts so badly. You know, it's such a, a terrible emotional, psychological hurt that it's in order for me to survive. I just as a defensive mechanism just need to disconnect from like any real sense of my identity. Hmm. OK. Um... I should say, though. It's important. I, I talk, I like work with this one psycho psychologist uh, with her nonprofit psychopathy is psychopathy is dot org. And yeah. she's a, always says, you know, but not everybody develops a personality disorder or a psychopathy this way. So I should say that, like, not everybody experiences trauma, but I usually think there's there's something, you know, it's not maybe necessarily parents. There's something that kind of like seems to push them <laughs> down, you know, like genes don't get triggered for nothing. You know, sometimes they do, I guess, but usually there's some sort of environmental trigger that kind of helps those genetics express themselves. But those genetics express themselves to protect me. You know, like I could probably not have lived without some sort of defense mechanism through all of that, you know. And so it's hard not to kind of be grateful for it, too, mm -hmm. because it's what allowed me to, like, get to where I am now, to, you know, grow as old as I am without being just crazy. Yeah, I think lots of times, at least from for cluster B personality disorders, uh, it's lots of times they it grows as a self defense mechanism, especially narcissism. I know that for a fact, but I can't really mm -hmm. speak so much on sociopathy 
borderline, it's not a very well adaptive uh, self defense mechanism. It kind of no. causes more harm for the, themselves and the people around them. But um, yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, so I've heard this a lot when it comes to people who have sociopathy that they don't experience fear or they don't experience fear the same way. Kind of like how you said when you let off a gun next to someone who has, you know, uh, sociopathy and they won't get as startled as easily. Um, so do you have any fears or do you have any, um, I also know that you don't want to be tied to any type of weakness in any type of way, but do you have any fears or anything that, that in the past you might have experienced and be like, oh, wow, I think I, I think that might have been fear that I just felt, you know? Yes. So I, sh uh, I should say like, I, I don't mind being tied to weakness now, Okay. I guess post therapy. Yeah. I'm, I'm like a dummy, like an idiot. <laughs> like I have all sorts of weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm barely scraping by most days or whatever, yeah. You know? <laughs> but yeah. So one thing that's kind of interesting about fear is to kind of understand that there, there are multiple, I guess, emotions. And I guess, you know, this is true. I think we call them primary and secondary emotions, right? Primary ones kind of don't need a context. You know, they're simpler, they're more primitive, and they come from probably a different area of the brain, you know, that like lizard brain, right? Mm -hmm. So one of these emotions I have, or I guess fears is a phobia. And we know that phobias are like uh, kind of inborn, you know, like, so I have a phobia of rodents, and uh, I, I have a niece who even as a baby had a phobia of rodents, you know, she'd see like even a, a picture of like Tom and Jerry or something and be like, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, you know, have a real freak out about it. So, you know, and some people, it's not rational. It's not even like something that you learn from your environment. You know, some people have phobias of spiders or snakes or Indiana Jones, right, with snakes. So mine is rodents. And they still kind of haunt me in my dreams. And then other fears, I guess the fear that I would have would again be kind of most associated with like the way I was raised, which would be like the thing that, you know, I worried about, you know, maybe without even being consciously aware that I was worried about was that I would have like my personhood like violated again. So that's my biggest trigger always is if if it feels like I am about to have kind of my identity, my personhood, my autonomy violated, like a, a personal boundary uh, violated, then that is like the thing that like will spike my blood pressure, mm -hmm. <laughs> will spike my blood, yeah. my heart rate. Okay. Um, so what, uh, to flip it now, what kind of things do you enjoy? What, what, what's like? Uh, do, you, do you have any hobbies, or is there uh, anything that you just find enjoyment in partaking in? So the thing I love most, uh, probably to do, is uh, I like to solve problems, and the, one of the ways that I like to do that is musically. Like I, I think of music as kind of solving a problem, like a math problem that keeps just running constantly. And so I play in a, in jazz combos where you're improv and you're just given the chords or sometimes you're not even given the chords and you just have to kind of play off each other and just like make something up on the spot. So I really love to do that. I like brain teasers like that. I, I also like to, uh, that's my favorite way to interact with people is musically because I feel like, I feel like I've always kind of struggled to understand how people interact with each other and to kind of, you know, I've, I feel like I've mostly just pretended to mm -hmm. know <laughs> and kind of like masked, you know, to try to go along with like, ha ha ha, we're all laughing, right? You know, but not really connected with people truly. I've gotten a little bit better about that with therapy, but through music, I feel like I actually do connect with them. I think it's because it's like, you know, we're not connecting emotionally necessarily, we're con connecting like harmonically, you know, mm -hmm. ki connecting tonally through through the music. And like, if you just learn the rules of music, then you can, you know, it's like playing chess with somebody or something, you can kind of understand each other through this uh, different medium, then it was just easier for me to do. So I love to do that. There are other things that I just kind of love that are like self care things like I love to take and I love the sunshine. Like I've just stopped wearing sunglasses at all. I've just, <laughs> stopped, you know, just like seeing the sunshine the whole time. I don't really love to travel, but I do it because it helps me keep an open mind. I really try to, especially as I age, I feel like it's easy to kind of just get like 
self-assured about certain things, you know, that I, I shouldn't be so self-assured about, like I should be a little bit more, you know, tender or like ginger with the way that I hold my beliefs and not kind of insist on, on my world perspective over the other ones. You know, I try to stay open to, to new information that would kind of suggest I'm wrong. I guess I'm like a little bit freaked out by like these historical examples of like people being so self-assured, you know, like, oh, we definitely know. For instance, have you seen the movie uh, The Last Duel? No. Has uh, Jodie Comer, Ben Affleck, and Matt Damon. And it's like a 14th century French two knights are like dueling because one raped the other one's wife. And so it's like they joust first and then they they duel oh, to the death. Uh, is, did it come out like the early 2000s? I think no, I'm... it just came out like oh, okay. 2020 or 2021 or something. Oh, no, yeah, it's pretty reason. Yeah, it's like a true story. It's, it's super interesting. And they show part of the trial because remember, she has accused the other knight of raping her. Uh, and so it, all this stuff, since they're both pretty famous at the time, all this stuff was really well documented contemporaneously by historical records. And one of the beliefs that they had is that since a man has to orgasm in order to conceive a child, they thought the woman must have to orgasm too. So that was a big, wow, <laughs> that I've was a big question. Like yes, like yes, because like they were like, and they were so sure about it, you know, but we've been so sure about all sorts of things. Like the sun definitely revolves around the earth, you know, or this definitely is true. And it just turns out not to be true. So I just try to be really careful to to not be so kind of caught up in my own beliefs that I don't see kind of the world for how it is. Uh, so th that's what I like about traveling is it tends to open up my mind to be like, wow, you know, these people do this in a totally different way than we do. And it still works, you know, or, you know, it just helps me to break, I guess, out of like my day to day and understand that life isn't just like what I do in my normal Monday through Friday or the weekend schedule. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I got, I've never been out of the country, so I definitely got to, got to try that more. Um, so how do you view uh, people and the world? How do you view people? I used to view people, I think, in like a very shallow way where I thought, you know, like whatever is convenient for me is like kind of how I'll treat them or, uh, you know, I'll seek out people that I think are kind of convenient for me. And I would kind of manipulate them, you know, for various reasons. And the kind of the worst part about it was that I treated myself that way too. <laughs> like if there was like an aspect of my own self that wasn't convenient for me kind of to acknowledge, or I wanted to kind of like get something from my own self, I'd manipulate my own self. You know, I'd, I just kind of like, you know, try to like, uh, ignore certain aspects of my identity or manipulate myself in order to get what I thought I wanted. So it was a very, um, the ends justify the means kind of way to live, you know, and I just kind of thought like, okay, this is just how everyone works probably. Mm -hmm. And maybe mo some people do, or, or most people don't or something. I'm not sure really still about that. But then, uh, through therapy, this is like one of the main things that I did. I mostly went to therapy because I wanted to learn how to stop manipulating people because, you know, like if you say stop you know, manipulating people, that's fine. But what do you replace it with? What do you do instead with regard to people? Like I, it's almost like stop you know, manipulating people was a vacuum. You know, I had nothing to replace it with, but the, you had to replace it with something. So what my therapist had me do was this thought experiment where he said, you know, imagine that you are the only person in the world, you know, about a particular decision, like where to go to lunch, let's say. Uh, so just imagine you're not trying to impress anybody. You're not trying to guess what somebody else wants. You're not trying to, you know, think about like their commute or whatever. You're just going to come from like a place of true preference, your personal preference about this. And uh, kind of just Im when you imagine that there's nobody else in the world, there's nobody else's um, reactions to manipulate or to guess at or to predict or anything else. And so that was like a really good way for me to kind of learn how to stop manipulating is just to be myself, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> try not to affect people all the time or kind of manage people all the time, but instead to just be myself. And that's probably the biggest change uh, from therapy is now I'm just myself. I allow other people to just be themselves. You know, I respect their personal boundaries. 
And so I, I don't manipulate people at all. In fact, I'm kind of like, um, almost like, uh, hypersensitive to it. You know how like alcoholics can't even be around a bar or whatever. Yeah. I like, don't even come close to trying to manipulate people. Like I'll even specifically be like, you know, <laughs> you, like do whatever you want or whatever in this yeah. particular situation. Like I can tell, express my feelings about this and then that's it. And, and just kind of like, let go of, of what ends up happening. All right. Good. Good. So, uh, how do you think that people view you and do you care? Oh, I don't care. And I've never really cared unless it was like to, to get a particular thing. So, I mean, like typical stuff to try to get a job, you know, how can you kind of uh, impress people in uh, a job interview where I'm a lawyer. So it'd be like, how can I kind of, you know, get the jury to agree with me or get the judge to agree with me or whatever. So I still, I guess, kind of do use manipulation in those situations. Uh, but I think that that's just kind of like part of the that's part, part of, of the, the that's part of the game when it comes to yeah that's whatever. exactly part of the game or whatever to to do those things <clears throat> and then how people view me I mean I think like my family views me as kind of like eccentric and I've always kind of done my own thing they they would say that I've always just done my own thing but I would say I've always just kind of done weird things you know and not paid attention to the status quo but i wouldn't say that i always did my own thing i would say now i do my own thing because i know myself well enough to be able to choose to do you know things that reflect me that are like self-expression you know before i was just kind of like almost like it was like you know those like uh you know wheel of fortune type things where you spin mm -hmm. them and then you're like that's what it was like, like spin the wheel once. Oh, I guess I'm going to law school. <laughs> spin the wheel twice. Oh, okay. oh, I guess I'm moving to Los Angeles. That's how it always felt like it was random to me. You know, like it could have been any other things and like none of it really matters or has, you know, meaning. Right, right. It's interesting. Uh, so what is it like, uh, uh, you mentioned it a little bit before, uh, wearing a mask and stuff like that. Uh, I... I hear people NPD, they do the same thing. I know people with BPD definitely do. But what is it like? I guess but I hear for people who, well, I mean, I guess it could be all around percussive thing. What is it like being like, I guess, a social chameleon or wearing a mask or, you know, what what is that like? So what is it like when you're like changing it, you know, like how do you, you're interacting with this one person. So you kind of, you get a vibe of them, you get a read of them and you're able to just switch it. When, when you go here with this person, then you might be a little bit different. What's that like? Yeah. <laughs> I might not be so, explaining it super clearly, but. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I get it. So I talked to this one woman who she's, she's kind of like on the cusp of psychopathy, borderline personality disorder is how she would describe herself. Uh, but she said that like when she was like six or seven or eight, she was like very aware that when she just acted like her own self or just kind of like didn't mask that people were repulsed by her. And so like, I think that's usually how it starts with at least psychopaths is that you you realize, oh, when I say the things that I think, people do not like to hear it. And they give like this disgusted face and you know, like they, they exclude me from social functions, you know? So there are all these negative consequences that happen from kind of just saying and doing the thing that you would normally do. Uh, you know, if there was nobody around. So you kind of just learn to mask that because you don't want to keep, you know, enduring people's, I guess, social judgment about, you, you know, who you are, or your thoughts or or whatever else. So that's, I think, usually the origin of masking. And I would say most of the time, you know, like the great majority of masking is is just that, is to not, you know, to not kind of trigger the judgment of others, you know, about who you are. You're different. You know, people don't like you. <laughs> so you just hide it, yeah. you know, is, is most of the masking. Some of the masking is to do like other like little projects, kind of like I was saying, like manipulating judges or juries or trying to, you know, get them to like you, get them to like your client, get them to whatever it is. Or like I had like, I used to be interested in like kind of seducing people and it wasn't necessarily a sexual thing, but it was like, can I get them to be like interested in me, you know, captivated by me, uh, infatuated with me? Can I, am I able to kind of induce that sort of reaction in people? 
And in those instances too, like you would mask, but you'd be masking for a particular purpose. But I would say like 90% of the masking that psychopaths do is just to avoid being detected. Okay. Can you, uh, I mean, obviously you're not a, um, a, a, psychi a psychiatrist or anything, so you can't just go walking down the street picking at people. Yeah, I know you're a sociopath. I know you're a sociopath. But I feel like you can kind of, you can see it in other people. You can kind of recognize it. It's like, oh yeah, I can kind of see this person. You might not know 100% with accuracy, but you can kind of tell this person might be a sociopath. Is that true? I think there are certain tells, you know, uh, one of the tells for me at least is like eye contact, I, that there is truth to that. Like most people cannot sustain eye contact past a certain level. And so if you want to kind of test where somebody is a psychopath, like kind of like engage them and not a staring contest, you know, mm -hmm. not something obvious, but just like maintain that eye contact as you're talking, you know, or, or a natural eye contact without looking away and see if they look away. And uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty well-established one is that psychopaths maintain eye contact more and for longer uh, than regular people do just as a trend, you know, like maybe some psychopaths are an exception or something. Another one that I look for is uh, like that weak sense of self type stuff, you know, so if they don't really seem to have you know, a strong identity, particularly about things like, let's say their gender or their sexuality, you know, they seem like really fluid with kind of who they are sexually or, or gender, or they don't really care about the nationality or their race or their, you know, they don't really seem to kind of be, you know, caught up in uh, any of these kind of identity markers. They don't have a favorite professional sports team, you know, that they're a diehard fan of. They don't seem to care about even like, you know, their intelligence maybe a little bit or or some of these other kind of just like accidents of birth. They're just they're like um, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard used this word to describe them. They're like a cipher. I always love that word. <laughs> they're just like kind of a nothingness. There's like a nothingness about them, you know, like they're just like a gas or a water instead of like something solid like they they seem to take on the shape of whatever vessel they happen to be contained in in that moment. I think that's a pretty good indication. I think especially, you know, for men, for whatever reason, because women, it seems like, you know, can have at least socially, it's more sec socially acceptable, I think, to show like a broader variety of sexuality and a broader ver variety of gender. Maybe I'm just speaking for my own generation. Maybe the, the younger generations are are different about this but for men i think it's a little bit rarer for them to be kind of like gender fluid for mm -hmm. them to be sexual orientation fluid okay um yeah i, I agree especially the, the, the newer generation coming up it it's uh you know i have nothing against anybody of any sexual orientation whatsoever but it is very like you know uh there's he she they them there's all these different pronouns there's and it feels like everyone's kind of like a flag waving in the wind sexually but you know i mean it, it, is, it is and i mean i'm, I'm happy I, anyone being themselves um i'm happy for it so um well here's a, another yeah. good thing maybe is like uh you know uh because i'm a professional musician i often kind of end up in like uh, situations where people are introducing themselves with their pronouns which i think is great you know you, people have different pronouns and it's helpful to just get the pronouns right away and so you can understand uh and and you know use the their preferred pronouns i don't have preferred pronouns like people could call me anything and it would not like back to me in the slightest that's kind of what i mean is like they don't seem like you could call like sociopath dudes a sissy or whatever and they just be like whatever i <laughs> it doesn't trigger them like yeah. at all they're not like they they don't care about their masculinity like almost at all okay okay so um so you, uh, you said, I know, I, well, I know that you, uh, you're a Mormon. I don't know too much about the Mormon belief. Um, I'm assuming it has somewhat similar values to Christianity, maybe Judaism. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but, uh, do you feel like being, cause I know you're also religious, you, you say you're religious and I, I don't think just because you're, uh, 
have a certain diagnosis or whatever that you can't be religious. But do you feel like there's any confliction between the two? Uh, so I guess my view of Mormonism and maybe like what makes it kind of easy for me to kind of ascribe to as a belief system is that Mormonism of all the kind of Christian beliefs, because it is still centered around uh, Jesus, mm -hmm. is that it, it seems like real sci-fi to me. Like it seems like I've kind of mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Like Mormonism basically is just saying consciousness didn't develop on this earth. It developed somewhere else. And so basically mm -hmm. kind of like aliens planted us here is like the Mormon belief. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, and like planted us here and this world was created basically as a simulation. And the what we're trying to do is like, so the consciousness develops somewhere else, right? And consciousness that, that is like human consciousness develops, this is Mormon theology, develops from a certain type of matter, which it, the Mormons call intelligences, is the, is the type of matter. And we believe that like this person that is God or Heavenly Father it's just kind of like he just found a bunch of this. He developed that way himself, right? Developed consciousness. You know the, uh, have you seen the second uh, Guardians of the Galaxy movie? Yeah, I haven't seen it in a little while, but yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, so the character that Kurt Russell plays, I think the dad, is, the, oh, yeah. the main character's dad. Yeah, that's what he, what he describes as Mormonism. So oh. he like developed consciousness and he kind of kept evolving until he was able to manipulate matter and make himself a body. So that's who we believe is like this, like Heavenly Father God character. And then he tried to, like a gardener, tried to help uh, foster conditions that would foster consciousness in other matters that are us. Like I'm an, an came from an intelligence matter that fostered, you know, the consciousness was fostered, et cetera. And, and instead of taking like trillions of years to develop, like he did, he sent us down to this um, simulation. So it's kind of like boarding school, <laughs> you know? Oh, so we like, okay. yeah, progress faster and, and evolve faster, kind of like he did, uh, but kind of compressed like a pressure cooker, you know, uh -huh. like can cook things faster. Uh, and then, but the whole point is that we're trying to, you know, become as evolved as he is. That's the idea of Mormonism. And I think, yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me. <laughs> okay. Um, so I know you've interviewed a lot of different people, uh, um, uh, psychopaths uh, or sociopaths. Uh, I know you use them interchangeably. And I, I kind of feel like uh, to a certain point, it's like splitting hairs when you try to really deviate between them. But you've interviewed... Um, all different types of people with custody B personality disorders. Um, I know you said your father, you feel like he has a narcissistic personality disorder. What commonalities do you think, because obviously they're in the same cluster for a reason. I've noticed certain like lack of identity, uh, which I guess would be come along wearing a mask. I I've noticed certain similarities, especially that one. But do you know, have you recognized in your own any research or whatever people you've talked to, any commonalities between the cluster Bs? Uh... Yeah, that's a good question. Like between the cluster Bs. So I know the most about cluster Bs probably uh, because we have kind of, I mean, sometimes people say borderline personality disorder. They're like a part-time psychopath. They're like sometimes very emotional and sometimes very cold, mm -hmm. you know, and, and detached. I've, I've heard that. Like, I don't know. I haven't known that many borderline personality disorder people like personally to where mm -hmm. I'd be like interacting with them a lot. I do think though, like this idea, like if you think of the psychopath as a weak sense of self and you think of the narcissist has like two sense of self, like the one that they project outwardly of like perfection and superiority and the inner one of shame and like deep insecurity. Uh, so that's kind of how they their sense of self developed is that they have a sense of self. There's just two and they're very different. <laughs> and then the borderline personality disorder is a lot like the psych. The psychopath, they're like a lot like the psychopaths in that they can be kind of chameleons and take on like the personality characteristics of the people that are that are around. But the psychopath does it like with like still like a great detachment. And it's my understanding that the borderline personality pr disorder people will do it, but like totally inhabit that role. You know, I guess yeah. they're kind of like method actors. You know, they like really they drink their own Kool-Aid about it. They're like, no, I am this type of person now. And so that they still have that strong sense of connection to their identity, but their identity is just very fluid and changeable. 
And the psychopath is also fluid and changeable, but doesn't have the connection to the identity. Okay. They're still just disconnected from everything. They know that they're just, you know, they're they're just showing up. They're like a TV actor, <laughs> like yeah. a D-lister actor where they're just showing up and saying the lines, you know, just to get the paycheck or whatever. So that's kind of what I think about the the three. I do think this is that those what they all have at their root, their core is the same with all personality disorders, though, which is some dysfunction with their identity, with their personality, with their sense of self. And it just manifests itself differently, depending on like a lot of things, I guess. And so I think like with, uh, you know, we can kind of draw like broad strokes and kind of say this is this is more this or more that or something. This person tends to manifest it more this way. But they they do share a lot more in common with each other than than they share in common with like normal people, I guess, because yeah. they all have like this the same root cause for for what's happening. And I think it's a little bit interesting to me. Like you look at psychology, and there seems to be, I would say, like uh, you know, maybe like several years ago when I was talking to my therapist, my therapist would say things like. People are, there's a movement where people are kind of pulling away from like, you know, being very careful about putting personality disorders into a specific personality disorder. Mm -hmm. There's like a movement to see it more as like a spectrum of behavior. Like they, they have a personality disorder with these features, you yeah. know, they have certain features. So you could mostly be borderline with some features of, you know, avoidant personality disorder or obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And so he would say, you know, for instance, uh, he would say with my antisocial personality disorder that certain features he thought, you know, were like best addressed, in, at least in therapy, by thinking more like it, there were aspects of obsessive compulsive personality disorder because I would have like compulsive thoughts. So he'd be like, OK, yeah, you do have like ASPD features, but you also have some features from this. And but the root cause is still the same, regardless of what personality disorder it is. It's all that you have that personality disorder. <laughs> you know, you yeah. have that disorder with the identity. Gosh, you got so I like I like the uh, the boat analogy that I've heard you bring up a few times. I actually I watched the interview I was watching <laughs> uh, that you did yesterday. I, I you brought it up and it made me think. Oh, I gotta ask her about that. Could you describe the boat analogy you had for the for the uh, yes. Yeah, and I it's funny I think of this boat because I don't have that much experience with a boat, but I almost died on a boat from like a similar thing. <laughs> like, oh, just, man. yeah, well, like hanging off the from. back of the boat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> if uh like a normal person is like in the driver's seat of their boat, like their boat is like their identity, their personality, they they feel connected to it, they're in the driver's seat, you know, they don't feel kind of out of control with regard to who they are as a person. They have like a pretty stable foundation you know, uh, developed, I guess, from like age two, you know, through probably age 25 is when you start to have like a, a pretty solid uh, understanding of who you are as a person, sense of identity. And then personality disorders are just like you're not in that driver's seat. And depending on where you are in the boat or outside the boat <laughs> is the is the different personality disorder. So I think with regard to borderline personality disorder, it's like you're hanging on the back of the boat. You know, and that's kind of a precarious position to be in because you're not in the driver's seat, but you're also still connected to the boat like quite a bit. So you feel every movement of the boat and uh, it can feel like really volatile, you know, because you're not con you're not trolling it and you're still, you know, affected very directly by everything that happens to the boat. Whereas a psychopath is kind of like, you know, like a 30 meter rope or something behind <laughs> like oh. hanging back. So the boat could be like zigzagging and you don't feel hardly anything. You're kind of yeah. going in the same general direction, but you're not as like, you're not as connected to the boat. And so you're not kind of as susceptible to whatever the boat ends up doing. You know, you're just like kind of hanging out back there. But I think that probably through treatment, what happens kind of to everybody with the personality is sort of you're trying to get them in the driver's seat of the boat. And in order for the psychopath to do that, they have to like climb up the rope, <laughs> you know, get to the boat and then make their way back into the boat, you know, and it's not a process that happens like in a few minutes. It's like a process that happens over a few years, probably. So there's at least a, some time period in which the psychopath who's trying to like get back in the driver's seat 
is like actually in the, the position of the borderline personality disorder where they're like hanging on the back of the boat. And I kind of called this like my emotional puberty where I'm finally connected to my emotions and kind of trying to identify with my emotions but I don't know how to manage them. You know, I don't know how to do any emotional self-regulation. And so that's why I say it's like puberty because suddenly you have all these feelings you don't know what to do with. Yeah. <laughs> and so I had like, a, it was like a two-year-old, you know, I would get angry at people, you know, and then think, well, because I'm angry at them, they must be a baddie. And that's the reason why I got angry at them. And then since I thought, okay, this person's a baddie, I would think I can do whatever I want to them. You know, I can be bad back to them. And so I'd mistreat them, you know, and then they'd be like, hey, why are you mistreating me? And I'm like, you're a baddie or something like, mm -hmm. you know, I have a bunch of nieces and nephews and I've been like hit in the face <laughs> mm -hmm. probably like 20 times by toddlers when they get angry with you. No. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how I was. I was like a toddler. You know, I'd, I'd be angry because at something and I'd like hit them in the face, not like physically, but, you know, kind of like, um figuratively so i think that that is like a, a difficult thing to do to get back in the boat i think that uh like there's there's like quite a bit of work to do but i also think that it suggests that there's more connection than we might think to the personality disorders like borderline and psychopathy if you can just say like you're just different distances from the boat but mm -hmm. you're still kind of in that same situation is kind of an interesting idea to me okay yeah, I, I always like that boat analogy. I, I was, I, I, someone that I was close to who had BPD, um, it, it wasn't so much a boat. It was more like they were just on a train, on a train cart by themselves, and they weren't driving. There was a state of mind they were put in, and they, they weren't driving it, but they were still along for the ride. And that's yeah. kind of, of course, a train isn't as volatile as a boat going left and right and all this other stuff, but um, that's why I like your analogy because it explains the volatile emotions of it. But uh, that's she. But it was more like a numb feeling. She was just on a train by herself. But she was going. But it just she wasn't in control of it. So yeah. So I, when when you said that, and I heard when I first heard you say that, I was like, that's that's almost the same thing. It's very close. It's just talking about driving something and not being in control of it. So I always like that. Um, I just have a few more questions. So uh, do you think you said you're going through therapy? Um, they always say that people with ASPD or sociopathy, it's untreatable. There's there's nothing that can fix it. Uh, do you think that help, that therapy has helped you? And do you think that, of course, it's on a person-by-person -person basis, but do you think it could help other people as well who are going through it? Well, I think if you think of it uh, as a personality disorder, there's treatments for personality disorders. And I think you mostly treat it like a, if you treat treat the personality disorder part of it, then you will like get a long way in terms of treating the psychopathy. You know, I, I can like to uh, go back to what I said at the beginning. It's not like the therapy made me normal, uh, but it probably did make me undiagnosable. Like there's still certain things that I'll probably never get back because just my brain, you know, like missed certain windows of opportunity to develop a particular way. And now it's, it's a little bit stuck, you know, mm -hmm. so I won't feel effective empathy probably, you know, never in my life, but I've gotten better about cognitive empathy. You know, I've been, I've kind of like through therapy gotten better at what's called perspective taking, like putting myself in yeah. somebody else's shoes. Probably. Yeah. And so it's like a little bit of a prosthetic, you know, uh, for effective empathy, you know, I, I can still get by, I think, and and live a happy, productive life, have good relationships with it. So I think to say that there's no treatment, it's not like they've proven that there's no treatment. They just haven't found a treatment. But have they tried? Yeah. What have they tried? I'd like to hear what they've tried, because it seems like <laughs> they for, haven't for, tried very hard. For people with BPD, there's DBT. And whoever's watching yes. this, whoever's watching this who has BPD, I've personally seen over a year's time how the negative symptom, the, the negative symptomatology of BPD decreases while going through DBT. I personally witnessed it. Um, someone I was close with was after two months in told me, you know, you don't have to yell and scream at someone to get what you want. You know, you can just kind of talk to them nicely and they'll, and they'll, they'll you know, they'll, they'll respond in, in, a, in a, in a similar way. 
And I'm like, this person is 25 years old. And I'm just like, this is kind of something they teach you as a, as a kid, or at least that you're, most people are taught as a kid. And I, it was at that moment I realized what I was kind of dealing with. But yeah, uh, DBT works magic for any, not magic, but it works very well. I've noticed. It works. As long as, yeah. you, stick to, as, long as you stick to it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so what advice would you give to another person with ASPD or another sociopath to help them, maybe not make them a better sociopath, but maybe to make them, uh, from what I understand, people with sociopathy don't have so much inner turmoil, like the way a narcissist or someone with BPD has. They're more okay with how they are. There's not so much, maybe not okay, but they're, they're, they're not so much, there's not so much inner turmoil. So when I say help them, I guess it's a little tricky of a question. I don't really mean help them be better at their negative symptomatology or better at uh, manipulating people, but what advice would you give them? I don't want to say to help them fit in better because that's kind of the whole chameleon aspect. So what, what advice would you give someone that might just be struggling as a sociopath that make to make them just be a better version of themselves, whatever that means. So I think that when psychopaths tend to struggle, it's usually because they they feel like life is meaningless. And the reason why they experience that it's kind of like a, this existential angst, like absurdism, which is, you know, why am I making any of my choices? Why, why choose this versus that? None of it matters. Uh, so if that's what they're experiencing, mostly they don't experience that in the playground stage. So <laughs> if they're post playground stage and they're experiencing that, then my advice would be to stop masking you know, like uh, try to be yourself and instead. And I, I think, and I'm writing a second book about it, that the sense of meaning and fulfillment and purpose that we get from life comes at least in part from a sense of self-expression. Like we are living our life's purpose. We're, we're living our life according to like the unique person that we are. And without that self-expression, Things seem absurd and and meaningless. This uh, kind of pervades your your experience of life, you know. And it is, I think, because you you wonder like, why am I, you know, that you have no emotional psychological connection to the things that you're doing. But when you self express, you are connected to that because those things are you, mm -hmm. you know. So like all your even your daily life choices become this this means of self expression and kind of reinforcing you and your purpose and your existence. So. That is kind of like a really tall order, <laughs> I yeah. think. Like that's definitely not something that can happen overnight. But I think to think like, let's stop masking because the masking is the a big problem for most. It takes so much energy and it makes you resent the people around you. You know, if you feel like you can't ever just be yourself around the people that you, you're supposed to love, you know, or they're supposed to love you, I should say, then that can be really like grading, you know, that can yeah. like really wear on your soul and make you kind of soul sick uh, because you think, you know, what's the point of any of this? So I would say stop masking. And then from there, just try to as much as possible to learn about yourself and to make your choices from a, a deep sense of inner preference and self-expression rather than trying to make the choice based on kind of manipulating people or, or, you know, like a, kind of a quick fix or a quick, quick pleasure or a quick anything, you know, as long as you, I guess the, the real kind of motto would be like, try to be as 100% you 100% of the time. I like that. I like that. Um, so uh, my, my last question, what advice would you give to someone who is dealing with someone? Obviously um, they, this is the thing uh, people, they have, uh, Lots of times when they don't like somebody, they say, oh, that person's a narcissist or that person's a sociopath. And like, they don't really know, they, well, at least they don't know the symptom criteria or what it even takes to be diagnosed with a personality disorder. But um, so it's hard to say like, you know, everyone might think that they're dating a narcissist or a sociopath or just someone, you know, I, I've heard that a lot. They, they don't like, I don't like this person over there. My ex was a narcissist. And I'll, I'll ask the person, well, did, did he do this or this? Did he ever do this? No, no. And I'm like, so what, you just don't like him? So he's a narcissist? So for people watching, it might be, you know, I don't want you to think your lover or whatever is a sociopath or anything like that. But what if, if someone is dealing with someone who's exhibiting 
the traits that you've talked about earlier. What advice would you give to them to maybe help better their own lives? Would it, you know, whether it's maybe leaving them all together or if they're kind of stuck with that person, they have a kid with this person. What advice would you give to them to help deal with their situation? Yeah. So this this works for everybody, I think, but it works especially well and I think surprisingly easy. People might be surprised how, how easy it is uh, with uh, psychopaths, especially if there's good will there. If there's kind of bad will there, then you'll do it, but it will be more difficult. But I think just a really clear expectations, uh, set expectations and personal boundaries, like enforce them like mad, like, you know, 100 percent, because they're they're not going to necessarily have like their feelings hurt about personal boundaries the way some people do, you know, some people, they're not going to feel rejected or whatever, mm -hmm. like actually psychopaths tend to do well, especially if there's, there's goodwill there. If you just say, you know, you know, please do not do X anymore. You know, it bothers me. They'll just take that information and just stop doing X. You know, they're, they're constantly looking anyways for information about, you know, what, how people are going to react about things. So they'll, they'll just take that and kind of run with it for the most part. You know, it would be har a hard thing to share custody with a, a psychopath. I don't, I think some of those more extreme situations, you still need to put up the boundary and just enforce them no matter what and be kind of so uh, vigilant about it. And this may mean, you know, like reading a book about boundaries, you know, and like trying to, you know, start, start easy with, with normal people first until you get better <laughs> about putting personal boundaries. Cause that's the main thing that harms us from personality disorder. People is their boundaries were never respected. So they, they never learned about personal, exactly. personal boundaries. They don't know how to respect the boundaries of other people, but that's the harm that comes uh, from them is that they, they uh, do not respect the personal boundaries and then they end up kind of harming you in, because of that violation of the personal boundary. So since that's the cause of the harm, like the, the way to kind of prevent it is to just be like, no, I will enforce these personal boundaries. Oh, you said X, even though I told you not to. I've, I've been in situations where I just like block people immediately be like, okay, you know, and not like a... Uh, Personal boundaries are not ultimatums. You know, they're just like, it's not like I'll do this if you do that. It's just that I don't find this acceptable. I will not accept this. And then however you choose to act when they violate that is up to you, you know, but I'll just block people and be like, okay, why would I be around somebody who doesn't respect my personhood, does not respect like this thing that's most sacred, you know, to everybody, you know, like your, your very self or whatever. Uh, so I think, that's a hard thing to do because we as a culture have almost forgotten <laughs> how to have personal boundaries and enforce personal boundaries. Yeah. I think a really good book to read. I always recommend it is Nedra to Wobbs. I think it's find boundaries, find peace. I forget what the first verb is. Enforce boundaries, find peace. Uh, but it's such, such a great book. She has like such great wisdom about it where it's kind of like very deep personal. It's not like I, I can't enforce boundaries because they're going to react that way. It's like, no, you always enforce the boundary because the boundaries, the boundary is the thing that helps the relationship, mm -hmm. right? She says you, you have boundaries with relationships that you want to keep, not ones that you yeah. want to get rid of. You know, the boundary is the thing that's going to allow things to like live and thrive. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be my advice. Yeah. I always tell people you learn more about somebody by telling them no than by telling them yes. So, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, Emmy, I really appreciate you getting on my channel. I can't wait for your second book. Uh, whenever it drops, I would love to. Uh, I would love to read it. And um, yeah, thank you for getting on my channel. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You as well.